Uh, aloha. Talofa. Casalalia. Casalalia. Half a day. Bula. Bula Minaka. Now we're ready. Uh, um, I uh, have built in some audience participation, and I want to thank the people in advance who've agreed to be part of that. Um, as you can see, the talk sort of uses uh, waves of change as a kind of organizing metaphor. Um, uh, during the talk, if at any point you feel like you surf that particular wave, you're free to stand up and show us what you've got uh, in terms of your surfing moves. Um, I, uh, I've organized this briefly around sort of three roles I've had over my life at the college and my life at the East West Center and the University of Hawaii. Uh, first as an anthropologist, and then as a funny thing called an accreditation liaison officer, which I've done for 20 years, loved every minute of it. Um, and, and then as an administrator, um, that will be the first very brief part. Uh, one of the things that happened during the 90s, there was a lot of soaring rhetoric around what civic engagement was, and that's where my audience uh, partners are going to help out. They're going to show us their rhetorical flourishes as they relate to civic engagement. And then a little bit later on UH sustainability policy that was just passed about two or three weeks ago. We're very excited about that. It was the, only the second major change in UH, UH system policy in the last decade or so. Uh, there was one other one, and that was where the university asserted that it wanted to be a, a leading indigenous serving institution. So just in the last decade or so, we've had two big policy directions from our board one around indigenous students and indigenous communities, and the other around sustainability. Uh, then I'm going to go through these decades uh, of engagement, learning, achievement, and then project uh, out to the next couple of decades on things that I think we really need to be paying attention to uh, as we uh, advance our work. First, following up from Puanani Burgess yesterday, um, I'll tell a little story. I won't be quite as good as Pulinani's. Um, but when I first went to Samoa in 1975, I was five. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, I arrived at Pongo Pongo on a flight. I think it was a, a Continental Airlines flight back in those days. And um, when I got there, when you arrive in Pongo Pongo, there are hundreds of family members greeting people returning home, Samoans returning home from the U.S. And, and, and Hawaii. And then we popped into a pickup truck. Uh, it was about three or four in the morning. I know it was still dark. And as we drove along Pongo Pongo Harbor, uh, the sun was coming up over the, over the bay. And playing on the radio was Ringo Starr's photograph. Do you remember that one? All I've got is a photograph to remind me of the things we used to do. Anyway, uh, so <laughs> I'll do Crocodile Rock later, but not right now. Um, so I w did a presentation for Livier a few years ago where I tried to integrate civic music because I think it really does inspire our, our work. Um, but I just sort of used that picture and that photograph as a way of thinking about memory. I've been looking at the life and legacy of, of, uh, of a number of people who have, who have passed in the recent years, and, and they talk quite a bit about memory and how memory has been important to their moving forward. So memory uh, is a very powerful thing. So sort of memory can lead to momentum. Um, let me go back one slide. One of the people I've been reading about is the late Nelson Mandela, and I'm hoping to sort of finish off with his ideas about memory and, and social cohesion. So I get to the, the Samoan village, and they, you know, there's a huge welcome by the village chiefs, all of this oratorical flourish, quite remarkable uh, interaction, welcoming formalities, protocols that you see yeah, throughout the Pacific, and particularly in Polynesia, where chiefs are a big deal. Um, the first day is pretty non-eventful, and I, I go to sleep, and I think I've had a pretty good day. About 
three or four in the morning, I'm, I'm laying on a mat in a Samoan Fale, and these three young men come up and say, Vave, Vave, which means quickly. And, and they, they kind of roused me, and I go, geez, what did I do now? You know, I'm in trouble. Anyway, so they tell me to run across the village because the, the chief of my traveling group wants to talk to me. So I, I go up. I think I'm okay still. <laughs> um, and he's sitting on the, bo- the first step of a fale, a, a chiefly fale, a house. And he says, come up, come up. And there's a kava bowl there, and there's a lot of pitted kava at the bottom of it. And I said, I hope I'm not having to drink that. Um, I don't know where that's been. Um, so uh, he says to me, uh, Robert, um, we will take very good care of you while you're here in Samoa. Um, but we're counting on you to help our communities when you go home. Okay, so it was this moment of reckoning with the concept of reciprocity. Well, what does that mean? I'm, I was 25 at the time. What does that continuous reciprocity mean in my anthropological work with Samoan communities? So of the different things I've done over the years, I've been trying to keep that reciprocal relationship established. So that concept of reciprocity obviously will uh, come up later. Um, when I talk about ecological anthropology, people sometimes get put off by that many letters. Um, I tend to look at it in terms of four E's. Uh, employment, education, uh, and I, I just finished a ninth grade textbook for the American Samoan school system. Environment, I just published an article on cultural triggers to fishing effort by traditional Samoan uh, fishermen. Um, in 1996, I did a piece on the meaning and management of water in ancient Hawaii. And then I presented that at an international water conference at SIOS University uh, just last year. So uh, employment, education, environment. And then the fourth is engagement. Uh, student, civic, community, scholarly. I think sometimes we, we blend all those in and we don't pull them apart and really think about the differences. I'll try to show what those are. Two H's in ecological anthropology. Uh, housing, uh, published an article called From Houses Without Walls to Vertical Villages. Uh, this became the sort of research background to our Palolo housing uh, service learning work with UH Manoa and Chaminade University. In 1994, I published an article on uh, health issues for Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. And this was when Hillary Clinton was first talking about uh, a national health care program back in the early 1990s. And I bring that up because some of these policy battles wage on and on for many generations, more than even decades. Civil rights, for example, the work of Nelson Mandela and others, that work still goes on. And I'm going to propose that the work around sustainability and climate change it's going to be one of those long decade, decade, decade generational battles. And we have to be braced for that longer term uh, work. Um, I'm going to use these slides uh, to indicate different decades and different things that I think were emphasized in higher education in those decades. If at any point you feel the urge to surf, if you feel like you surfed the engagement wave in 1990, you can stand up and show us what you got. I know you all, many of you surfed the 1990s engagement wave. Um, this began for me with the work of Ernie Boyer at the Carnegie Foundation, one of the great quotes um, about higher education. We should not only prepare students for productive careers, but also enable them to live lives of dignity and purpose, generate new knowledge, and channel that knowledge to humane ends, study government, and help shape a citizenry that can promote the public good. And, and I got to work with Ernie on a, public, a, a program called Building Communities at the American Association of Community Colleges. Um, and we, we came up with this definition of community, and it's, it still resonates with me. A community as a region to be served and a climate to be created. Uh, and, and sometimes you get into these long de- debates about what is community. I just fire this at them, and they keep arguing, and I'm good. Okay. Uh, Throughout the uh, 90s, there was a sound body of literature uh, developing around student engagement. And certainly Sandy Aston's work at UCLA, where I first met Elaine Ikeda, the work around student involvement and showing really positive results around student involvement, student engagement. Chickory and Gamson, I put this in red because this is in every single grant proposal I write. 
If you don't have Chickering and Gamson at the front of your lit review, you're, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. Uh, so I just will point that out to you aspiring grant writers. Uh, this is the one. This one was transformative as we moved from the 80s to 90s. And then there was this by Tinto. Um, then Pascarella and Terenzini. My Italian are brothers, the Franco and Tinto and Pentini. Anyway, um, that was my Italian shtick. Um, and then all of this work, George Koo, um, that leads to the National Survey of Student Engagement. The community college version is called the Community College uh, Survey of Student Engagement. And then this one, we all remember this one. How many people remember this one? Raise your hands. Yeah, this is the one, yeah? They found the learning and service learning. Woo! Huh? That was a big one. Big, thick book. Put it on. It's been on my desk, on my bookshelf, prominently for at least 15 years. Okay. Um, I'm going to use this idea of the roaring and soaring in 1990s. The soaring will be around the rhetorical flourishes you're going to hear in a minute. Um, a lot happened in, in, the, in the 90s. Um, Campus Compact, of course, launched a little bit earlier nationally, um, founded by presidents of Brown, Georgetown, and Stanford University. I was so happy when they asked me to come to work with them. I said, wow, community colleges with this crew, wow. Community colleges with Brown and Georgetown and Stanford. Wow, we somebody. <laughs> we somebody. This is whiz. This is cool. Um, uh, they, but it was interesting, the first iteration of Campus Compact had a, also had the Education Commission of the States, which was all of the which is all of the K-12 superintendents from all 50 states. So that K through 16 piece was there at the very beginning. I think we've lost a fair bit of that, um, but I won't have time to go into that. But we can talk about it later. The rationale behind this, and this is on the Campus Compact website, was that the media was portraying college students as materialistic and self-absorbed and more interested in making money than in helping their neighbors. Um, we don't know how much progress we've made on this, and it isn't just college students, right? It's, it, when I read this, I go, yeah, this is more than a college student. It's like you know, most of the societies this way. Why is that? Um, anyway, um, uh, the president has argued that his public image was false, that many students on their campuses were involved in community service. And then Campus Compact did this really marvelous tactical logistical thing where they created state offices right now most higher ed associations do not have those state offices and I think this is evidence of what those kind of networks can do so I'm gonna and these state offices would provide encouragement resources and supportive structures so I'm gonna stop here a minute and ask all of the state campus combat directors and their staffs to stand up how many do we have here and the staffs Thank you all very much. And, now, and then I'd like the, like the directors to just say what year their, their offices were established. Tina, I know yours, but go ahead. 94, that was a good year, okay. Somewhere in there, yeah, all right. Oregon in the house? Okay, uh, Utah's in the house, aren't they? 1996. Any others? Twenty twelve. So you went you went roaring right into the new millennium. Right into the new millennium. That's how you are, Steph. You roared right into the new millennium. Okay, and then of course Elaine. Nineteen eighty eight. California. Woo! Okay. So so this is all going on in the eighties. We're building a lot of momentum. Um, we got the National Youth Leadership Council, the Education Commission of the States. Uh, who remembers Terry Pickerel? Woo! Uh, educate every student a citizen, learning indeed. And there were all these really cool wing spread conferences that people could go to. Um, of course, there was, is Gail in the house? Hey, Gail, please stand up. Uh, Gail ran the AAC, AACC Horizons Project from 1995 to... 2012. So she roared right into the new millennium. Thank you, Gail, for that work. Livier was before the Campus Compact National Center for Community Colleges. She's now the Community College 
National Center for Community Engagement, and that's not as easy as I made it sound. But uh, please, Livia, please take it. So Livia Khan's from that center, and that center has drove right into the 20th, 21st century too. And it's that center that's hosting our new Teagle Grant. There was the Campus Community Partnerships and Health, ah, the Corporation for National and Community Service, and then this, this, this one. How many people have seen this question? Ooh, no more money, no more office. How do we institutionalize service learning, that, that, when there are no grants? And then, of course, the biggest piece of rhetoric in the, in the 90s was a beautiful book by Ben Barber called The Aristocracy of Everyone. How many people read that book? Okay, that's a good one. That's one of my favorites, because it's sort of about, like, chiefs and aristocracy. Okay, how about that one? How many people have read work by Edward Zlikowski? Okay, uh, Service Learning in the Disciplines. 18 monographs. The service learning field gets disciplinary cover. We know we're in all the disciplines now, or potentially in a lot more disciplines. And then throughout the 90s and into the first decade, a sound body of literature has established robust correlations between student engagement and a subset of educationally purposive activities and positive outcomes of student satisfaction, persistence, academic achievement, and social engagement. That's a really good piece there for grant writing if you're gonna to write to uh, uh, your institutional outcomes. Vicki Trotter's uh, summary of that. Okay. Now we're getting into the soaring rhetoric. And with us today is Linda Jacobson from the World Bank. So Linda, tell us what civic engagement means at the World Bank. Civic engagement is the participation of private actors in the public sphere conducted through direct and indirect interactions of civil society, organizations, and citizens at large with government, multilateral institutions, and business establishments to influence decision making or pursue common goals. Thank you, Linda. That's some pretty soaring rhetoric, and I can just envision the committee that wrote that, and uh, Tanya. Okay, the next uh, representative in the house is from the Center for Democracy and Citizenship. Please. In American history, dum, dum, dum. Dum, bum, the citizen has been not only a voter or a rights-bearing member of the nation or a consumer of services. The citizen has also been a producer, a public-spirited agent in problem-solving and common work. Tough challenges will require widespread civic involvement that taps the common sense, energy, insight, and effort that comes from citizens with different talents and from different points of view working together, often across lines of sharp, cultural, partisan, racial, and economic differences. Woo! Wow, that was sorry. That, in Hawaii, we call that a chicken skin moment, the way that was read. I'm glad I gave you guys a little lead time on it. Okay, next we have the... Uh, a Duke University with a very succinct but powerful statement. Civic engagement is being sensitive to and understanding the world's problems as well as addressing them through collaboration and commitment. Great, thank you Duke. Sorry about the Sweet 16, it was sad for me too to see. Okay, now Occupy LA is in the house. Our mission is to educate and empower people to engage in hands-on democracy in order to individually and collectively take strategic actions to identify and address the root causes of local, state, federal, and global issues of social and economic injustice and concerns. Wow. All right. Okay, so everybody from the World Bank to Occupy Los Angeles has something to say, and, and you, you'll have access to all these statements. And, uh, it's a good little exercise to, to have people say, you know, what are the words that really jump off the page where I think some of the readers did a really good job of hitting rhetorical moments where the, the words were more important to them. Uh, and sometimes words, if, if words should tr jump off the page at you. There should be sort of a magnetic attraction by you to certain words. Sometimes this rhetoric gets so long that you kind of lose the forest for the trees. 
This is the one we're using for the Teagle Grant. This is one by Paul, uh, uh, Tom Ehrlich and Ann Colby. Uh, a morally and civically responsible individual recognizes himself or herself as a member of a larger social fabric and therefore considers social problems to be uh, at least partly his or her own. Such an individual is willing to see the moral and civic dimension of issues to make and justify informed moral and civic judgments and to take action where appropriate. So this is the definition we're using for this, uh, the, the Teagle Grant. I got to do a lot of work with, uh, with er Ehrlich and Colby in the first decade. Okay, things shift a little bit in, in 2000. And uh, what we see is a decade of, of learning. That might be a little small. Um, the first thing that happens in 2000 is the National Research Council report on how people learn. This is by John Bransford. Uh, and this, this publication has been uh, 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 revised uh, with uh, advances in how we understand the operations of the human brain uh, through the whole decade. So the brain research on how people learn has just gone very, very quickly on what we know helps people learn. And what helps people learn is to be engaged uh, in the learning in, in ways that uh, stick, to use Polinani's term. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education, uh, the Spellings Commission. How many people remember the Spellings Commission? Okay, the Spellings Commission was the Bush Initiative Department of Ed, and they created this thing. How many people have heard of No Child Left Behind? Okay. Um, and so there was this... Um, concerned that No Child Left Behind, that's all of that standardized testing, was going to trickle its way from K-12 to higher ed. And we had a lot of this at Kefialani that it was going to be some sort of test that we were, students were going to have to take. And I think that, that's still out there. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but the Council for Higher Education Accreditation and then regional accreditation bodies, there was a sort of strident push for a learning outcomes assessment that was being driven by the Department of Education. That's still with us. I should add that many of these waves have continued to hit our shores. It isn't as if that one wave stopped. They've continued to kind of uh, hit us at different points. And I think that's oftentimes why we're so tired, is because we've been surfing all these waves for so long. I'm glad I was at 8.30 this morning, because by 10, I'm done. Anyway, uh, uh, so this, this we've all felt. Um, AACNU's Greater Expectations, and then the Higher Impact practice came, Practices came out. This was a very big moment for service learning because this was the, the research of George Koo and the National Survey of Student Engagement saying that service learning was a demonstrated high impact practice that you want to use when you go back to campus. And I'll show you why. But that was a big moment for us uh, when this national organization, with that was undergraduate research, internships, first year experience, uh, writing intensive. They have, I think there are 10 major high impact practices. If you're not doing those, you're doing the wrong thing. That's me talking like a director of institutional effectiveness. Dang it, I know you have all this passion and intuition, you think that's gonna work? Forget it. Uh, do the high impact practice. That hasn't gone very far, that's uh, too strident. Uh, okay, so Tanya and I were part of something really cool, uh, American Council on Education, Assessing International Learning, and the term we used there was global competence. And I know you can't read that, but I'll make it available to you. That is a really good body of work around how to assess uh, global competence. We didn't get to global citizenship. We kind of pulled back from that concept. But we did a lot of work here um, that's been nationally disseminated. And then the National Science Foundation has a program called CENSOR, Science Education for New Civic Engagements and Responsibilities. And it's there. Their tagline is using the science of learning for the learning of science. And so they're, they're circling back to the first study there on the new brain science and how people learn. That was that decade. Also during that decade, we came. I thought the best definition of civic responsibility came out of the Horizons Project. I still do this with two and four year audiences. Uh, the service learning prepares students to pub participate in the public life of community in an informed, committed, and constructive manner focused on the common good. I really like this definition because uh, the informed, I don't know if this guy's working. You see the informed? This is like my remote control at home. Um, the informed is really the knowledge piece. When we talk about knowledge, so informed is knowledge. Uh, committed is an attitude, right? It's not a, it's sort of 
So you get, you get knowledge, attitude, and constructive is what? Skills. Okay, so this is a really good definition. I use this a lot uh, uh, when people are starting to hone in on what is it we're supposed to be uh, preparing students for. And Gail and her team did a great job on this. Um, what was also nice was that the accrediting commission for the Western region made civic responsibility a required general education learning outcome. Woo! Woo! That was big. Um, but at Kapilani, we don't have it yet. Uh, we. <laughs> oh, so sad. Uh, we have self and community. It's a really eloquently worded general education learning outcome, and that's really where we target a lot of our service learning assessments. Now, I was in Chicago with Kathy Engelkin and, uh, at an Obama conference call, and he talked about service learning preparing citizens to care for their communities. Isn't that beautiful? Eloquent, simple, right? You like that one? Use that one. You like that one? Use that one. You, can, you don't have to say it's Obama. You can say it's something you created. You just happen to hear it at a conference someplace. Uh, the other one is, he said, service learning is a force multiplier for the nonprofit sector or for civil society. Now, the Lumina Foundation currently has a new degree qualifications profile that is focused on learning, and it goes from the associate to baccalaureate to master's degree. That's it. Um, it's a degree profile across two, four, and graduate work. Pretty cool. Really interesting conversation going on in the West. The Western, what's Witchy? Witchy is the, I don't know, I never remember that acronym. W I C H E, Council on Western Institutional Commission on Higher Education, something like that. But they're doing a lot of work around uh, these because our students are so mobile, they're at different campuses all the time. So they're kind of, and this is a little scary to me, but they are trying to standardize some language around gen ed. And I worry when that happens that what do you get? you get some sort of standardized test. So this is one to keep an eye on. Uh, if, if, if you hear somebody's doing the Illumina Foundation degree qualification profile, there's lots of good things about it, but there's a little downside in terms of whether it leads us to some standardized testing. So that threat's still out there, um, although I think there's a lot that's good there. Um, the community engagement classification comes out in 2006. Um, and this is a nice short thing. It's not as roaring and, and soaring as the civic engagement rhetoric. Um, community engagement is the collaboration between institutions of higher education and their larger communities, local, regional, state, national, and global, for the mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge and resources in a context of partnerships and reciprocity, right? That's the word. You can't do this work unless you're really serious about reciprocity about recognizing both the needs of a community and its assets and trying to match those and share those for a long-term partnership. Uh, this built on four years of research at Campus Compact. Are there other people that were involved in this work at, at Campus Compact? I worked with Ed here. That was a real wonderful experience on, on the, that research. Okay, where's my next soaring rhetoric person? Here you go. Now, this soaring rhetoric piece continues to today. This is a statement by Peter Levine that he presented to the National Academy of Sciences just in the last year or so. So, Peter. Active citizens seek to build, sustain, reform, and improve the communities to which they belong, which range from small voluntary associations to the world. Active citizens deliberate with peers to define public problems and then collaborate with peers to address those problems. In doing so, they honor certain virtues such as equal respect for others and a degree of loyalty to their communities that does not preclude critical thinking and dissent. Collaboration, actual work, is just as important as deliberation. Nice, that's a good one, thank you. I think we need a microphone. Now that's really cool, but Peter goes on. People who merely talk about public issues are ineffectual and often naive and misinformed. We learn from acting together. By collaborating, citizens construct or build public goods, tangible goods like schools and markets, and intangible ones like traditions and norms. In doing so, 
They create civic relationships, which are scarce but renewable assets for civil society. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Appreciate that. Thank you for coming all the way here to read that book. All right, so there's plenty of this definitional work that's been done. I would suggest that when you get access to these slides or if you haven't done this work, that you try to parse out what really works for you and your faculty, and your campus, and your community. And do this with your partners uh, who will probably put more emphasis on reciprocity and, and this share, you know, both their assets and their needs. Achievement. Who's been surfing the wave of achievement? No? Wow. You better be. <laughs> All right. Achievement. Uh, this comes out of the Obama administration. So the Bush administration has their Department of Ed initiative, and it wafts its way out through the accrediting bodies. And the Obama administration really shifts the focus to knowledge and skills for the jobs of the future. This is the kind of career-centric piece that has emerged even more profoundly than it did in early decades, sort of career centrism and our role. This was particularly targeted on community colleges. Liberal arts and other universities are feeling it too. Uh, they had a strident push for degree completion. Once again, the US will have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world by 2020. Uh -huh. uh, time to degrees, only 25% of low-income students complete college in six years. Almost all students from wealthy families attend college. Only 50% of students from poorest income groups attend college. There's still wide disparities in, in uh, diversity and access and, and success. Uh, the new thing that's on the horizon, and Obama's going to have a kind of national tour on this, is um, a new Department of Education rating system, not a ranking system, a rating system uh, that will be based on tuition and tuition costs, availability of scholarships, access as measured by the percent who receive Pell Grants, graduation rates, students post-graduation earnings. Wow. Uh, from my position as director of the Office for Institutional Effectiveness, I have four terrific IR people that work for me. We have no clue how we're going to get that data. Because uh, our, you know, our students, you know, they come and go, and they, it's a very, pretty permeable service sector economy, and some of them will get into nursing and careers at the 60 and 70,000. Many will be at the 25 to 30,000. So I don't know how they're going to do this one. Uh, but clearly there's the potential for institutions that are uh, very expensive and doing this very well and have strong, really strong alumni associations and recruitments by major corporations, those schools are going to do very good on this measure. So there's a lot of inequity in the measure. So you better keep your eye on this one. This one in the Lumina Foundation. <laughs> okay? Um, and if there is an Obama tour in your neck of the woods, you, you should go put in your point of view. It won't be Obama, it'll be people from the Department of Education. Um, student debt levels. This is where the community colleges come out way better, uh, generally, uh, if they don't transfer. That's a nice little twist on this measure. They do better if they don't transfer. Um, that's no good. Uh, and then institutions will be ranked in peer groups. And the real threat is the colleges that can show their students get higher salaries, they'll get more peer, Pell Grants, get more Pell Grant money. Okay, we're ahead of this one. Bob has taken you ahead of this issue so that you'll pay attention to it. This wave is like here, and I want you to kind of either duck underneath it or to get on it and move it someplace else. That's not physically possible, but metaphorically it's. <laughs> okay, so what we decided to do at KCC was to focus on three types of measures. One was engagement, and these are our, all the SESI measures. The other was achievement, and this is course success, fall to spring persistence, fall to fall persistence, uh, time to degree completion, time to transfer. Okay. Uh, in, in the big state university systems, there's a real tendency for there to be lots and lots of data. And either we're swimming in it, or we're what? We're drowning in it. Okay. And what should we be doing? Surfing on it. There we go. Okay. Yeah, so we want the data to move us in the right direction. 
So I've been trying my best to convince the administration, just have all of our faculty and staff focus on those quantitative measures over there. They don't need to see the whole data system for the university. And then over here on the learning outcomes assessment, uh, Fran, can you stand up, please? Fran Akoba, Tanya, who else is here from the service learning assessment team? Uh, anybody else? Okay. Well, Fran's doing a workshop on our service learning assessment methodology. Uh, that's this afternoon, yeah? Yeah, so that learning me methodology was what convinced the Teagle Foundation that we were going to be focusing on student learning of civic and moral responsibility. So Fran's work, thank you, Fran, for the years you put in on that. I, we're, we're very appreciative of that. You can applause. Uh, and he'll be doing a workshop at Livier's conference uh, May 19th. So if you want to know what's going on in service learning and learning outcomes assessment, keep an eye on the work that Fran's doing and the work that we're doing in the Tinkle Foundation grant. You're, you're all going to be seeing more and more emphasis on how do you know students are learning from service learning. And so that's the sort of focal thing we're going to try to do in the Tinkle grant. We have this cool vision statement. Uh, Kapiolani prepares students for lives of critical inquiry and effective engagement and leadership and careers which strengthen the health, well-being, and vitality of the individuals, families, and communities that support all of us, the cultural traditions that shape and guide all of us, the land and sea that sustain all of us. Um, some people want this to be our new mission statement. This sets up really what we're going to do around sustainability and climate change. Um, and that's going to be around community engagement and building community resilience. This is my physics of civics slide. This is the, you're not quite yet, not quite yet. There's a physics faculty in the room. I've got, got them right in my line of sight here. And so um, I've got these concepts from physics. Um, inertia is no longer acceptable. No more inertia. None of that. Uh, we need to grow momentum around sustainability and climate change in what Mitch Thomasow from the, uh, I'll get back to Mitch in a minute. The planetary emergency. That's a good term. Uh, but we need to build and figure out how we're moving forward in a planetary emergency. Colleges and universities need to develop tactics that have social and intellectual multiplier effects in teaching, research, and service. We need to put these three things together, right? We can't keep research, because the research is telling us climate change is happening. I think there were you know, two, 300 scientists that just finished a re report on April 1st. The researchers are telling us there's a problem. And the teaching and the service has not been brought to that problem. Our institutions still have the research faculty, the teaching faculty, and the faculty that do uh, campus and public service. Those people all have to get in the same canoe and get moving. Uh, that's a new They can surf. The, canoes can surf. So. Okay. So words and actions must have magnetism, pulling us all together in light of socially corrosive trends. I'll talk about those in a minute. And then this idea of idea flow. Human social networks spread ideas and transform ideas into behaviors. And this is a kind of a new field called social physics. If you Google that, you'll see that those folks were doing this physics of civics way before I thought of it. But there's a really nice thing going on around, around uh, social networking. Sustainability response to a planetary emergency. Uh, the sixth mega extinction. Uh, plunging decline in biodiversity. Rapidly changing climatic and oceanic circulation. Biogeochemical imbalances. Okay, definitions of sustainability. The UN came up with the first one and it really focuses on the decades ahead. That is, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Okay. Now, the National Science Foundation, this is really cool. This is like in the last few months. Uh, in their sustainability uh, science funding stream, All right. Uh, sustainable world is one where human needs are met equitably without harm to the environment or sacrificing the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This definition brings us back into the present. It's a very important development. It's about now. It, the verb is are, not will be. 
the definition really shifts to our resources being shared equitably right now. And, and what's the future heading forward? Everybody know ASHI, the American Association for Sustainability in Higher Education? Come on, you got to know this one. Um, they have a sustainability tracking assessment and rating system. They have these really cool projects. And then Krista Heiser at our campus, using their course identification criteria, created 25 courses uh, that are either sustainability focused or sustainability related, and they're designated in the schedule that way. So students can follow a sustainability track through their general education program. Most of those courses use service learning. Anybody know this one, the president's climate commitment? You, did, how, many, how many people know their presidents assigned this? I, knew, I figured you did, Tom. Okay. This is something that college and university presidents sign, and then they hand over to the director for institutional effectiveness and say, Bob, what, what are we going to do here? Uh, um, so the, the idea is a really good one, uh, to create a sustainable society by transforming higher education itself. This, this is the idea that our campuses are in ecosystems. We're not outside of ecosystems. We are in the ecosystem of the community we serve. There are streams and rivers and estuaries and, and you know, endangered species all around us, and our campuses are right in the middle of those things. So uh, this, this supports senior lead, leaders in making healthy, just, and sustainable living the foundation of what they do. And in this program, there's a central role for institutional uh, community engagement. Mitch Thomasau was here for the UH Sustainability Policy Conference last, a couple weeks ago. He has a new book out called The Nine Elements of a Sustainable Campus. Get this book, put it on your president's desk, and say, what are we doing to become a sustainable campus? And see what he says. This is where the work is. When we set up the second sustainability summit, we said we've got to get the presidents involved. We've got to get the vice chancellors for administrative affairs involved. We've got to get the auxiliary service people involved. And we need to get the faculty teaching differently. Oh, this is what Mitch talks about here. There are all these operational issues, all of the waste we do. And let, while I'm on this point, let me just applaud the hotel and the staff for the wonderfully sustainable cups and glasses and water. Can we all give them a nice big round of applause? That has all happened here. You know, so when you go to conferences, ask yourself, did the organizers really think about sustainability? Right? Why are we, you know, why is there all this paper and waste? So I'm really pleased to see we haven't been a wasteful uh, group, uh, these, particularly here in Honolulu. Um, a really cool uh, website is Equal America. They have a cool program called Momentus. Momentus. Um, uh, it's a new strategic organizing and communication initiative to build a game-changing increase in personal and institutional support for climate change um, solutions by local, and by using local and regional impacts. Forget the national dialogue. Get going locally and regionally. If you share a stream with another university, clean that bugger up, right? If you've got soil issues or, or any kinds of, of environmental issues in your, camp, in your community, you and other campuses share common ground there. You can do something about that, and you can do it now. You don't need to wait for the debate around climate change to be finally settled. Uh, teaching climate change, uh, Tom Friedman's book's really good. Um, has a chapter on 205 easy ways to save the planet. Sustainability has this really interesting character because it's in everything we do every day, every moment, right? But it's also about saving the planet, right? And that's a much more multi-generational, uh, collaborative, focused effort by a lot of us. And he says it's going to require revolutionary change. National Science Foundation, if you want to teach climate change, go to the sensor site, the National Council for Science and the Environment. They have a website called CAMEL, C-A-M-E-L. It's climate adaptation, mitigation, and e-learning. Anybody can teach climate change. Anybody can teach climate change. It doesn't need to be something that just the science people are doing. Sustainability, soaring rhetoric. You guys ready? You've got the green light? Okay, so here's some of the language out of the UH sustainability policy. 
again, if you want it, take it, use it. We think it works even beyond these uh, wonderful islands. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I would have put R before world, but this was pretty good. Uh, our, our communities, our state, and our world. Uh, they weren't so bold as actually claim the world. I guess that sort of a post-colonial mentality. OK, um, two. Thank you very much, Regent. We appreciate that. <laughs> Last piece. Wow, that was good. That's a good one, yeah? We'll keep that one. That one's going right into our new strategic plan. Um, but that, that was really nicely worded. OK, um, what's going to happen is we're going to be partnering with some new folks on this. Um, there's a book called Earth, the Operator's Manual. Everybody know this? Richard Alley. He's done a long series with PBS, PBS on Earth, the Operator's Manual. Um, in there, there are quotes from the Department of Defense. And the Department of Defense is in a position where it can't really wait anymore on uh, total consensus on climate change. It's seeing sea level rise, and it's trying to figure out what it's going to do about it. We have really key tactical assets throughout uh, the Pacific, uh, Southeast Asia, and in many coastal communities around the world. And the Defense Department realizes it's in trouble. It needs to build piers that are further out of the water. It needs to figure out how to spin off technologies that benefit the civilian community as well, as they did with the internet. Um, we will partner with academia, other U.S. agencies, and international partners to research, develop, test, and evaluate. And they're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in support of UH climate change, U.S. climate change initiatives. The DOD is already moving forward. So people that we may have sort of thought weren't in our camp before, they're in our camp now. They're building the camp. They're building the camp for us to begin to realize that we all have strategic and tactical interests uh, in any place that's touched by the Pacific Ocean. That there will be literal waves of change coming and we need to respond to that quickly. Now, I was at a meeting last week at the National Guard, which is right up the street from the college, and they talk about citizen soldiers. And the term that I've never heard before was civ slash mill. How does the civilian community work with the National Guard for disaster preparation and disaster response? These are new partners, people. There are new people, and the, the, your National Guard are, are people that we typically have not engaged with because we've been sort of trying to distance ourselves from militarism, and I understand all that, but there's a lot of work going on in communities and in National Guards, and why? Because there's a lot of National Guards been coming home. Hallelujah. The National Guard is coming home. That's good news. But what, you know, there's a lot of real talent in that National Guard, and, and we're going to probably begin partnering with them. The other people we're partnering with is the Red Cross locally, nationally, global organization. A lot of uh, impact in the Pacific, a lot of impact in the Philippines recently. And the, the other group that was at that table was the Boys and Girl Scouts, which was cool. And then there were high school students. You know. And what was the motto of the Boy Scouts? 
Be prepared. Boy, if you can't build on that. Um, okay. All right, so the, uh, Obama's got an executive order out, and he defines preparedness. I'm not going to go through that. He defines resilience, mitigation, adaptation. All of these words need to move into your vocabularies. The words matter. There are actions that need to be taken. And then the UN IPCC panel uh, just on uh, Wednesday. Throughout the 21st century, climate change impacts are projected to slow down economic growth, make poverty reduction even more difficult, further erode food security, and prolong existing and create new poverty traps, the latter particularly in urban areas and emerging hot spots of danger. Do you have any of these around you? Do you have any of these hot spots, these poverty traps? Have we done enough? No, We've done, we haven't done enough on any of, of that particular thing, poverty reduction. It's a 2,600 page report by more than 300 scientists. And that's the only part I'm gonna read. <laughs> I mean, it's too much, right? It's too much, all that science is too much. So that's why I gave you the CAMEL climate change site, because they, they really do a good job of uh, teaching climate change in a publicly understood way. Social cohesion, I'll finish up with this. Um, there are aggressively competing perspectives out there. And let me tell you, the end of this talk changed after I heard Pulinani Burgess yesterday. Because I had these two competing perspectives just slugging it out. You know, the willing and the unwilling, that whole exercise she did. And then I heard the story about the American soldiers stuffing the rifle in the ground in an Afghanistan village. I said, we probably need to start doing some of that. One side is sort of an Ayn Rand objectivism around the proper moral purpose of one's life is the pursuit of one's own happiness, rational self-interest. We all get a lot of this. I'm not gonna just say students get this. We all get this, the sort of focus on rational self-interest. And the only social system that's consistent with this morality, it's not politics, it's a morality, uh, is one that displays full respect for the individual rights embodied in laissez-faire capitalism, okay? We know that's out there. There's another ruling this morning, I don't know if you heard on something about uh, corporations and their unlimited ability to, to pay for elections. But for this side, for this side, and this was a quote I heard a, a couple weeks ago, climate change is a liberal strategy to grow big government. And what, radio, what TV station do you listen to? I won't go there. Um, but this is, this is their perspective. Now, this is huge, and, and it's important, as Punani said yesterday, how, does the other, how do other people see it, right? We need to understand how other people see this, and that's how, this is the, the sort of main paradigm on, on that side of this debate. On the other side is there's more government regulation of energy industry and investment in alternative energy is needed to save the planet. We're all involved in saving the world. Wow, what could be more powerful than that? Let's get busy. Got work to do. Build some momentum. Okay, this, uh, the corporations as Citizens United contribute mightily to political candidates who support their lazy fair agenda. It's quite strikingly, it's fearful to me. I'm afraid of this. I'm scared. <laughs> What's going to go on? Is America going to become an oligarchy? The next decade will tell. And this goes in sort of contradiction to what Ben Barber thought was going to happen back in the 90s. There wasn't going to be an oligarchy. It was going to be an aristocracy of everyone. Wow. How did that happen? How did we all let that happen? The other side's really tough, too. You have science, evolution, and climate change affirmers versus religion, creationism, and climate change deniers. That whole debate's going on out there. What, what's our role? How do we as campuses in collaboration with civil society organization, mediate these competing perspectives. Will government need to expand? Or will higher education and civil society bridge these gaps? I think we need to get to work on bridging these gaps. These communities are on opposite corners of the boxing ring, and they're just not talking to each other. Meanwhile, the planet is in an emergency. The planet is in an emergency, and there are two sides that are not willing to talk. This is really, really troubling. And we as universities need to get involved 
in creating those moments for dialogue. There are going to be new partnerships with the military. Increasing probabilities of climate change impact. They can't wait for certainty. They're reacting now. They must avoid catastrophic risk. And this is a fun one, particularly with my business colleagues at the table here. And there are other business people here too. In the business community, real, resilience is defined as the, the ability to continue doing business. Right? I'm up now. All right. So business people are beginning to get this, and they're getting that because their insurance rates are going to start going up. The actuarial tables are based on probability. And as this data comes in, insurance companies are going to start saying, you better not build that there because we're not going to insure you or we're not going to insure you once. Because if, if you get something happens to you in that site and we told you not to go, you're done. So there's going to be a really interesting bringing together from the business community around continuing to do business. And it's, it's not just capitalistic business, it's all kinds of business. And then we need to synergize with research and service and then go back to our, our systems thinking with K-12 and higher education. Systems thinking is, the new, is in the new science standards. About 60% of the new K-12 science standards are in systems. Finally, to Nelson Mandela. The struggle for democracy has never been a matter pursued by one race, class, religious community, or gender. As future leaders of this country, your challenge is to foster a nation in which all people ascertain a, a social cohesion together. And these are what the African National Conference decides is. These are how we strengthen cohesion. Participatory democracy, culture of dialogue, accord, and commitments. Maybe it's time to start talking about student commitments rather than just student engagement. Might be another little advance of the field. What are students, what are faculty, what are campuses committed to? Build a social compact for growth and development. I don't know whether the ANC you know, impacted the, the concept of campus combat. Ensure public representatives are constantly in touch with the people. And this is the final thing. This is from his 2000 speech, 2008 speech. And if a 90-year-old man may offer some unsolicited advice on this occasion, it would be that you, us, irrespective of our age, should place human solidarity, the concern for the other, at the center of the values by which we live. Human solidarity, concern for the other, guides me as a citizen, as a human being, as a scientist, as a scholar, and even as an administrator. And I hope these values will guide your work in the decades ahead. Thank you.